Hi there, welcome and thank you for joining us today for our Progress Semaphore uh, webinar, Data Harmonization for Better Business Decisions. Uh, my name is Philip Miller. I'm the Customer Success Manager here at Progress, uh, looking after um, not only Semaphore, but MarkLogic and, uh, and a lot of other R technologies uh, in the Progress data stack. Um, joining us today will be Stephen Reed and Jim Morris from our Semaphore team, uh, both of which are very experienced in um, using Semaphore to solve some really key critical challenges within business and also looking at opportunities of ways to leverage data um, in context better. Uh, so without further ado, I will hand you across to Stephen. Phil, thanks so much for that introduction. Again, my name is Stephen Reed. I'm a senior account manager here with Progress Software. And I wanted to start today's session actually with a question. And the question is this, how do you know if you have a data analytics problem? And I'll give you an example because I've lived through this once or twice before in my time. Let's say you were called into a meeting by your boss and your boss said, we have a problem. And just for the sake of an example, let's say your boss says, hey, we've got a problem with sales. Why are sales down? And the conversation in the room goes something like this. The first person says, well, I think our sales are down because of insert reason here. And the next person in the room says, well, I think sales are down because of another reason. And the third person says, well, I think sales are down because of yet another reason. Well, let me tell you something. If that's the conversation that's going on in your room, my suggestion is stop because you've got a data analytics problem. The reason you have a data analytics analytics problem is because everyone is saying, I think. If you wanna make smart business decisions, you have to be able to say, I know. We need statements like, I know my sales figures are down because I see some softness in the European market and I've got the data to back that up. Now I can make a good business decision. And that knowing is what really is driving the ability for us to do good things and to make smart business decisions. And that's what today's webinar is all about. So the first thing we're gonna be talking about during our webinar is really some more of that problem space. What are the issues that we're seeing behind data analysis? And we're really gonna have a, I'll say a spin on that at looking at the unstructured part of the problem. I like to call that that 300 pound beast that's in the corner of the room that everyone is ignoring. Yet it's such a big part of data analytics. Once we kind of understand the problem space, we're gonna talk about how data harmonization can actually help fix that problem and how can it can align with both your data and your analytic strategy and how it can potentially be used for other applications as well. Uh, I'll then be turning things over to Jim, who will be providing us with a demonstration of some data harmonization, and then finally we'll wrap with a Q&A period. So let's kind of get into our first example here. Let's say I've got I, my data set here and it's in a nice, neat rows and columns, and it clearly identifies my state of jurisdiction and market capitalization for some various publicly traded company. And I wanted to be able to answer the question, I wanna know all companies that are incorporated in the state of Delaware with a market cap over $10 billion. Well, if my data looks like this, that's a pretty straightforward uh, question to be able to answer. But what if my data looks like this? What if the market capitalization figures aren't quite as neat and tidy as I'd like them to be? Okay, I can probably run some macros or do some kind of data transformations and get this in a format that I'm more used to. But then what if my data is like this? What if it's a bunch of PDF documents and the state of jurisdiction and the market capitalization values are buried inside these, these PDF documents? Now, for the purposes of our conversation today, we're gonna to make the assumption that these are just PDF documents. There aren't any XML or more data behind them to support analysis. It's really just raw PDF documents, raw Microsoft Word documents that I'm working with. If I wanted to be able to answer these questions about state of jurisdiction and market calculation, and all I have are these PDF documents, what would I have to do? Well, I'd have to go into each document Oh, uh, there's 50 states in a union. Yeah, it's probably going to be on the first page. I can probably pull off that pretty easy. And maybe, maybe I can figure out how to do that. So, I, okay, okay, I think I can solve that problem. But then what about market capitalization? Well, if I just do a search on market capitalization, this sample document, there's no hits. There, there, it's not in this document. Well, 
It is, it's just not being expressed as market capitalization. So I don't have an easy way of finding this information. So what do I have to do now? Well, now I gotta open every document, go through it, figure out how market capitalization is actually expressed in this document, and then pull that out. But honestly, that's just part of the problem that we have with unstructured data. Yes, it's in different formats, but then I also have the, the challenge of this. When I try to link data repositories together, both structured and unstructured or multiple structured repositories or multiple unstructured repositories, I don't always have a common language to talk about them. And even if I did have a common language to talk about them, I may realize that I might have very sensitive data in there, but I don't have an easy way of identifying it. I might know a social security number is a piece of PII, but if I don't have an easy way to identify it or tag it, it doesn't really do me a lot of good. And then finally, whether it's just simple through organic growth of your company or you're doing mergers and acquisitions, the number of data systems and data silos that you have just keep growing exponentially over time. But yet there's just one more thing we have to worry about too. It is the rapid expansion of data that we're seeing. So this is really, I, the first time I heard this statistic, it really took me back a little bit. But the recent analysis is there's something between two and 300 millions of terabytes of new data being created daily. That's a lot of data. Just to put that in some amount of context, that's roughly equal to either 100 billion books or about 40 billion movies being created on a daily basis. And what's even more frightening is a large majority of that data is unstructured. Yet most organizations are just using a very, very small fraction of that to figure out good business decisions because they're relying on their structured data repositories only. So the ultimate question then becomes, how do I know if I am making good business decisions? Well, we've got some good news. If you're familiar with any or all of those problems, a great way of addressing all of them is with through data harmonization with the Semaphore platform. Now, Semaphore has a lot of different use cases to it. It has a modeling component, a classification, and an integration component. We're not going to be looking at everything that Semaphore can do today. So we're really just going to be focused on the data analytics uh, capabilities uh, use cases around Semaphore. Uh, we will have other webinars uh, in the future about other uh, use cases with Semaphore, but today we're just really going to be focusing on the data analytics. So how would this work? How would we be able to get a, a better harmonized data story using Semaphore? Well, there's a couple important things to think about or remember when, we, when we're implementing Semaphore in inside of an organization. One is you can kind of think of it as a middleware. Uh, sitting between your data repositories and your applications. It kind of provides a translation service, if, if you will, between data speak and business speak. Um, but at a very high level, Semaphore provides these three services to your, to, your, to your data. It provides an enrichment service, a data extraction service, and a data harmonization service. So I'm going to talk about each of those here briefly. Uh, first, the data enrichment service. This is our ability for Semaphore to read a piece of content, structured or unstructured, document, PDF, we don't care, and be able to provide a set of metadata tags to it, meaning we can identify what this data item is about and provide a very consistent uh, label to that data. We can then do the, the basically the kind of the opposite function. We can look at a piece of document and extract facts out of that. Uh, states of jurisdiction, market capitalization values, people, names. If you can describe the thing that you want to extract, we can take that out of the document and surface that for better analytics. So that's great. And you just saw kind of an example of what we can do with like a PDF document. But now if I have multiple data repositories, what I really need to be able to do is to harmonize that data across both my structured and unstructured data, data sets. So we like to contrast data harmonization to data normalization, which you might be more familiar with. So typically data normalization kind of looks like this. Uh, you're launching a new application. That application is expecting a certain set of data to be available to it kind of in a certain particular way, maybe certain formats. So what do we do? Well, we go to various data repositories. We extract data out of those data repositories. We do some type of transformation function, and then we load it into another data repository. And that is the, the data set that my new application uses. 
Well, that's great when I have two data repositories and five applications I'm supporting. What happens when I have 100 data repositories and 1,000 applications I'm trying to support that doesn't scale very well? So our position is don't normalize your data, harmonize it. Leave it in its system of record and allow Semaphore to provide a translation layer between the underlying data and the applications that want to use that data. Now, for uh, business and data analytics, we're primarily just going to be focused on the data extraction and data harmonization, harmonization piece of Semaphore. And like I said, we'll have other webinars in the future that focus on other use cases around Semaphore. So what might this look like from an enterprise level? How can I think about data harmonization from an enterprise level? Well, if you think about a, a typical environment, you're going to have your data repositories here across the bottom here. You've got your structured, your databases. You've got your unstructured data, like your content management systems, your SharePoints and things like that. You've got your user audience across the top. And then you have your various applications that are trying to access the data inside your data repositories. Now, the thing is, if you think about how application one talks to or references data repository one, it might be completely different how it how it interacts with a different data repository. And I think a great example here is social security number, right? So how many ways can I represent the concept of social security number? Well, in one database, it might be referenced as EIN, employee identification number. In another database, it might be referenced as TIN, taxpayer identification number. But in my human resources file, inside a PDF document, when I filled it out the first time, when I first started working, it's referenced as social space security space number followed by a set of digits, right? It's all talking about the same concept, but it's being uh, talked about and stored in different ways in different for formats. So it's very hard for applications to be able to get the, get the right bit of information. In kind of the semantic world, when you use semaphore, kind of that all goes away, right? So now I can provide basically a translation layer between my applications and my underlying data repositories to be able to speak in concepts. So now I can talk about the concept of social security number. So an application might do something like this. It might say, hey, I need the concept of social security number from database one, two, three. Well, in database one, two, three, it's really stored as TIN, but the calling application doesn't need to know that. It just needs to work in the, it just needs to work into the realm of concepts. And this is also great for my user community because that's how users think. Users don't think about SQL statements. They think about concepts, social security numbers, part numbers, invoice statements, things like that. That's how your users think. So not only does it make it easier to develop the applications, it also makes it easier to elicit requirements and translate those requirements from your user community to the application to drive even better business value. And what's more important is that same level of business speak is exactly what the C-suite is talking about too. They're using that same language, that concept language. They're not talking about rows and columns and things like that. They are talking about in the world of concepts. And now I have the ability to give my C-suite the single view of all my data, and it's in the language that they understand. So data harmonization can be used for a lot of different use cases as well too. Today we are focused on doing it for data analytics, but really data harmonization applies to a lot of different things. It can also be used to develop enterprise knowledge graphs. It could also be used for semantic search and discovery. Your content management systems, your enterprise search systems, if you're finding it hard to find things in those databases, you can use data harmonization for that as well too. And then finally, data harmonization can also be, be used for your machine learning and AI initiatives as well. There's a lot of different industries that can benefit from data harmonization. These are just a representative samples of some various industries we've worked with um, throughout the years. But people have asked me, hey, Stephen, how do I know if my, my company is right for data harmonization? Like, what's really a good litmus test to use? And here's what I tell them. If you've got a lot of data in your organization and you have a very specific language that you use to talk about that data, you probably need a good data harmonization strategy. Think about healthcare. The last time you received an explanation of benefits, you opened it up. Did, it, did all those codes make sense to you? 
What about the last financial services statement you might have gotten? Did you understand everything that was going on in there? I've met at companies before where they literally had three layers of acronyms to describe something. They had an acronym to describe an acronym to describe an acronym. If that's your business, I guarantee you, you need a data harmonization strategy because you have a lot of data and you've got a very high, highly controlled vocabulary about how you describe and talk about that data. So I know a lot of you today are probably very familiar with progress. I know a lot of you today might be very familiar with Semaphore, but I thought it might be good to kind of introduce a little bit of both. So uh, progress software was founded in 1981. It's publicly traded on NASDAQ. Uh, Semaphore was found in 2006 and was subsequently acquired by Progress just this past year in 2023. But really the most important thing on this on the screen here today is that Semaphore for the third consecutive year in a row has been named by, met, by software reviews as the leader in metadata management uh, solutions. Um, if you have not already, really encourage you to go out to the Infotech website download the data quadrant report and see what other customers are saying about Semaphore. So with that, I'm gonna be turning things over to Jim for a little demonstration of how we can start harmonizing your data and turning unstructured data into structured. Jim, over to you. All right, thank you very much, Stephen. Uh, again, my name is Jim Morris. I've been working with Semaphore for about nine and a half years. Before that, I spent most of my career in uh, kind of life sciences, R&D functions, and either some information management function, library, uh, informatics, etc. So when I came to work with Semaphore, uh, I mainly focused on those particular types of industries, research data-focused organizations, and to help them understand what Semaphore can do for them. So in this demonstration, we're going to be addressing some of the issues that Stephen brought up earlier about trying to solve business analytics problems that require information that's held in documents and needs to be extracted from documents in order to make a, a full assessment of a business problem. So, for example, the idea of uh, doing some type of market analysis, competitive analysis, forecasting that requires looking at a bunch of companies, market capitalization, and the jurisdiction in which they operate or the, the state in which they were incorporated. And based on those bits of data, I may combine that with some of my structured data that I have and I can do some more sophisticated analytics. So we're gonna focus on where can we get that data that we need to complete our picture and how Semaphore can be used to get that data out of documents. And we'll look at some other capabilities of Semaphore as we go through this. The whole idea being we're trying to generate data and what we have instead are documents and as Stephen said you either have to open up each of those documents and read it or just manually create the data yourself. Semaphore is here to solve that type of problem. So let's look at an example. I'm going to go into a system that we created specifically to demonstrate some of this. So to show some examples of how Semaphore helps solve this problem. I'm going to log into a, a, uh, a system that we have that is actually running on our sister database called MarkLogic. And MarkLogic is a multi-model database, can store any type of data, it can instantly index it. So it's, it's a great tool to couple with Semaphore because Semaphore generates uh, data looking at uh, full text and documents and then needs to put that data somewhere and MarkLogic is a perfect place for it. So you can see here, in this system, we have a, a set of uh, 10K. So these are the 10K financial reporting documents that uh, the public companies need to report in the United States. And in that data, in these documents, are data points like the market capitalization that they report for the year, as well as where they are incorporated, which is an important distinction between just where they are located. And what's really important is we're looking at where they are incorporated, which has a, gives you a different picture of how these companies are affected by uh, regulations and, and uh, locations, uh, et cetera. So if I pull all my documents into Mark Logic here, into the search system, I can start to do my work. I can start to look for companies that are in a particular area of jurisdiction. So for example, if I wanted to search for companies that are Headquartered in Michigan, maybe I'll go up here in the search box up here and 
uh, search for Michigan, and I get back three results. And I say, oh, all right, well, I'll, I'll, I guess I have to open up each one of these, hunt through it, find the market capitalization, and then cut and paste that into a database and blah, blah, blah. Imagine if you have, uh, you know, hundreds of documents. That doesn't make sense. For example, what if I search for California? Well, I get back oh, probably most of the documents because they, re- they all refer to California somewhere, but we're, that's not what we're looking for. We're looking for the jurisdiction of California. And that's actually fairly uncommon to be actually be incorporated in California. So what, what can we do about this? Uh, we bring Semaphore into the picture. Semaphore is able to look at these documents and based on specific configurations that we put into Semaphore, uh, we are extracting the data points that we need. And I think that's an important point to bring out that Semaphore uh, can just get the data that you need for it to solve the problem that you have. It's not you don't need to build, you know, a data fabric of every data point you could possibly imagine in case you ever need it. The idea of Semaphore is you say, what data do I do I need? Where is that data? Is it is it is semi-structured, structured, unstructured? And how can Semaphore help to look at that data and make decisions to um, so it can be harmonized more easily with other data? So in this case, we're looking at these documents and we're extracting those specific data points. Uh, so let's look at an example of that. I'm just going to pick one in here. Uh, these are the ones that were found. So here, another just kind of a quick commercial for MarkLogic here is that it, MarkLogic is really powerful in that it can hold documents in multiple formats. And uh, so, for example, we're looking at here the PDF version of this of this 10K. It's the whole thing, all 150 pages or whatever it is. And uh, Semaphore has uh, already looked at these documents. So as these documents were loaded into MarkLogic, Semaphore was called and 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 then Semaphore returned uh, data. So, for example. Um, I have a view of the of the PDF here. That's one view, but we also have uh, a special view of RDF, and this is actually the 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 format that Semaphore returned the data in is in uh, uh, triples or specifically RDF, which is a a graph uh, database format. And so we return this this particular representation of the triples. Semaphore can return the data in whatever format you need it in. Uh, in this case, we're using triples. Maybe it's integrating with a, a wider enterprise graph and, and using triples makes sense. But what MarkLogic can do with that data is now it can build features into the user, user interface here where I can say, well, what is the jurisdiction of uh, of this particular company we're looking at? Uh, it's uh, Amgen, which is a pharmaceutical company located in California, but it's incorporated in Delaware. Uh, and if we look again, we can see actually pulled out the market capitalization. Was well, Stephen showed earlier, you know, market capitalization might not even be a phrase that occurs in this document. So we need to look up for that in very um, more um, richer ways to be able to find out specifically where this number is. And of course, there's other things here like the, the name of the company. Uh, we've even pulled out some names. We'll make, look at this later. Uh, the, the people that actually signed the documents. So these are all the little data points that we can pull out just as examples. So now we can see we could actually look through each of these documents and bring up these data points. So that's interesting. But what we really want to do is be able to report on this information. We need to be able to uh, pull this data into a database where it can be queried, combined with other data, and in order to do the proper the actual analysis that we need to do. So for that, we can look at a different view of this uh, system here. And here we just have search, which is you know useful. You can do keyword searching here and find documents that way. But we're, that's not what we're looking to do. We're looking at do analysis on the data that's contained in these documents. We want to turn these documents into, into the data we need. So we've done that with Semaphore. But now let's look at this uh, analysis tab. So this is good. So now we can actually uh, write queries. These are uh, just a few sample queries we put together using uh, the Sparkle query language, which uh, is the standard query language for uh, RDF uh, triples. And then I can say of the documents that I have here, uh, how many companies are, uh, how does it break out by uh, state of, of jurisdiction? 
you can see that Delaware, most of the most of them are in Delaware, and then California and Michigan. So even though California found all those documents, only two of them are actually headquartered, or uh, they may be headquartered there, but uh, more importantly, their jurisdiction is in California. So that's interesting. So then, but, but we're looking for market capitalization by jurisdiction. So that gets a little more sophisticated. So if we can run this query, now we're getting back a lot more data. We're getting the, the, the company name, uh, the market cap as a number, which is important. It may not be expressed as a number in the document, uh, but we're returning it as a number so that we can actually do calculations on it. And the state of uh, uh, incorporation here. So this is all, and, and this is using MarkLogic as well. MarkLogic is storing the triples. MarkLogic is, is supporting the ability to send uh, Sparkle queries uh, to the data and, and return it in this format. The data itself, though, is created by Semaphore uh, by analyzing those documents. So this is this is uh, useful, and you can incorporate this into your search systems and and provide this type of dashboard for your uh, for your customers. Uh, but what else can we do um, with this data? So I I want to take a step back and let's look in a little more detail about how Semaphore creates this data. And to do that, we're going to take a quick look at Semaphore. We're not going to look at all parts of Semaphore, but I do want to look at the at the tool that we use to um, analyze how Semaphore produces this data. And it gives you a, a, a nice peek under the covers the, of, as, as to the power and capabilities uh, of this product. So I'm going to skip jump over to uh, MarkLogic here. Uh, it's a it's a MarkLogic cloud service on which Semaphore is running. And here we have the Semaphore homepage. And Semaphore is, is a uh, uh, taxonomy ontology modeling tool, as uh, Stephen's already uh, pointed out. And everything we're doing, everything we did to configure uh, what Semaphore is doing for this demonstration is done through the modeling tool. But we're going to look specifically at this classification interface, which allows us to explore uh, how Semaphore is looking at documents. As it says here, it's a document analyzer. So let's look at one of these documents. This is just one of the 10 Ks that, that we have out there uh, that we were just uh, looking at in the search system. And I'm going to put that in through uh, for analysis. And so you see Semaphore has already looked at the, at the document. It's presenting it on the left hand side here. So this is what uh, Semaphore reads from the document. And then on the right hand side are the data results that, that Semaphore has produced. Again, according to precisely what we told it to do uh, through the modeling tool. So here you see the same data points that we were seeing in the um, in that search interface. We can see that it, uh, that it pulls out the uh, jurisdiction. And what's powerful here using this interface is we actually, if we just click on that, we can see you know where in the document uh, that was found. So let me just kind of make sure that it's doing the right thing. Maybe we need to tweak the uh, configuration a bit uh, to get more precise. Uh, the market capitalization, as we said earlier, that's actually a more a trickier thing to find because it's just expressed in a paragraph. And it could be expressed, you know, uh, as it is here, 36,174 billion. Well, we actually need that as a number. So as Semaphore was uh, producing this data, it also produced it as a, as a data point that could be used for calculations. The other um, uh, other stuff that's interesting here, we know we we have the reporting entity, uh, the actual company name, but just to show some additional some advanced capabilities of Semaphore, I wanted to point out how we can pull out the actual officers uh, from the text. So these are all the each of these extractions is dealing with a particular officer that it finds. For example, let's look at this one, uh, uh, Jennifer Barris here. And we can see well where where is Semaphore finding that information? Well, it's down here in this blob of text that you know uh, in in, a, in this particular 10K document it's described all the members of their board. And we're also finding things like the roles, like what is uh, Jennifer's role? And I noticed that we it it's expressed as Chief Human Resources Officer, uh, but we want to kind of uh, make that data more consistent. Maybe we're looking across uh, multiple sources of information about mem board members. Uh, so we're returning it uh, as CHRO. 
So just a little example of how we're using taxonomies or ontologies to help drive some of these extractions. Sometimes we're just looking for names, which our NLP as engine is able to find. Other times we're looking for things that are driven by taxonomies. Just another peek at the NLP engine, you know, notice when I hover over a term, some of our knows what these words are. Uh, it it's knows that this is a uh, past, past, uh, past tense verb. Uh, it knows that Jennifer is a, a proper noun. So it's already interpreted this into all this text, and that's how we're able to build. It's part of the reason why we're able to build such sophisticated rules and find the data points that we're looking for. We also often like to extract the context that this information appears in. This can be very useful for, uh, you know, uh, maybe you want to re review all of the officers in, in all the companies that you're interested in, but I don't want to have to open every document. Just give me the text that's relevant to the, uh, uh, to the information I'm trying to collect. And that's what we're doing here. So just to peek at what Semaphore is able to do uh, as one example. Um, and you can imagine using your own documents that have data buried in them, how w w knowing what the capabilities are, what, what, what is the data that you're missing that you could be uh, pulling out of these documents. As I said before, Semaphore can generate this data in any number of formats. Um, and so we saw back in, in that search system uh, how we were able to pull in uh, the data as, as triples. And that way we were able to do uh, triple type uh, queries, which is very useful. But maybe we're just trying to bring it into our BI tool, our analytics tool, our Tableau or, or Excel. Well, some of can generate that information too. So for example, for these same set of documents that we've been, that we've been looking at, uh, I ran a process, process against Semaphore to just generate uh, uh, tabular data that, that I can then use to bring in my, into my BI tool. So in my case, I just brought it into Excel. But you can see here's that same data. Here's all my documents and all the data that's been extracted from it. You can see I've got the capitalization and I've got the jurisdiction and all the other data points. Uh, in this case, here we have some more people being extracted. Uh, the signatories for the for the document are being pulled out. So a lot of data points all being brought in together at one point, in one place here. And then I can combine this with my other databases, uh, other or other systems. I can use Semaphore's ability to normalize or uh, harmonize information to say, okay, that role example. Like let's make sure everybody's referring to Michigan in the same way, or, or uh, the vice president in the same way. So if I'm looking for all the companies in Michigan whether it's internal data or external data, I can, I can make sure my data will connect because I've, I've chosen uh, the terms to do that. But once I have this data in raw format, then I can do uh, some of my analysis, uh, generate uh, charts and tables like this. It's kind of interesting. You know, I chose Apple as one of the uh, uh, companies here, and it's, Apple, of course, like blows every other company out of the water in terms of <laughs> market capitalization. Uh, but but because this is a dynamic uh, uh, table here, I can make decisions about what I want to include uh, and get a minor, kind of more interesting picture of, of companies that are maybe in the similar class. So again, this is just, you, once you have the data in a format that it can be used, in this case, I need it in tabular format. Uh, in another case, I might need it in XML, I might need it in RDF, I might need it in JSON. Anyway, we can produce it to, to be effective in whatever BI tool you happen to be using. Semaphore is there to produce it. So in summary, going back to what we've seen, we saw how Semaphore uh, can take a document and we can say, okay, what data points do we need from these documents? And Semaphore can, uh, even the process of uploading the documents into a search system or some database, some content management system, send the documents to Semaphore. Semaphore can produce the data in whatever format it's needed. We saw it produced in triples, and then we saw it produced in a, a kind of an analytics dashboard so we could explore how Semaphore was uh, performing. And then we saw it just produced as tabular data so that we can uh, use it in, in standard BI uh, tools like Excel. And you know, with, without this information, we won't be able to answer the questions that we're trying to get to. And that's the, the kind of the core message that we want to uh, express to you. And with that, I think uh, it's time to turn it back to Stephen. Great, thanks so much, Jim. So 
just to kind of recap some of the benefits of what we've seen and what we can do with data harmonization, really the most important thing is that ability to get the important relevant data facts out of your unstructured data repositories and then being able to bring that together. And because I can start bringing those uh, data sets together, I've now got the ability to eliminate the data and the metadata silos that's proliferating throughout my organization. And yet I have this other added benefit of being able to use the language that people are used to talking about my data. I don't have to turn about acronyms or things like that. I can now talk about things in the way of concepts, and this is the same speak that the boardroom is using. And then finally, because I'm able to do all this, I'm able to make better business decisions because I'm now using all my data, not just some of it, to drive what I'm trying to do. So some of you may be wondering, well, how do I start my data harmonization journey? How do I get, get down this path? Well, the very first thing you have to do is start defining your metadata. What does that really mean? Well, that really means those business concepts we've been talking about, you really have to be able to define them. And people often ask, well, where do I find them? Where do I start with that? Well, a lot of times, a lot of organizations already have them. Maybe they're just a, a spreadsheet that you may maintain right now, but starting to pull all that information together and realizing where that data is, is a great first step in doing through data harmonization. Now that I have that, I'll say metadata uh, space defined, I can use that to start harmonizing my information across all my data repositories with Semaphore, structured or unstructured, and that allow me to now do very interesting things from either a data analytics perspective or to integrate it with potentially other applications like enterprise search and content management systems. Well, thank you for your time today appreciate you taking some time out of your day to find out more about data harmonization. And I'm going to turn things back over to Phil. Phil, over to you. Cheers, Stephen. Thank you very much. And thank you, Jim, uh, as well, for, um, for for sharing that demo with us. Uh, really interesting to see um, the what you can achieve um, with Semaphore, um, even just in that sort of relatively simple example there. Um, so yeah, really good. Um, I've put a, a link in the chat if you want to know more about Semaphore, if you've got any questions about Semaphore, then please feel free to, to um, hop across to, to, to our website and have a look there. Um, we have now going to be joined uh, by Stephen and Jim, and I'm going to stop sharing my screen uh, so that uh, we can see their faces. Uh, Stephen and Jim, join us for a Q&A. Right, perfect. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you for that. Um, we've got some questions um, that are that are already coming in. Um, we've got. Um, let me have a look here. Um, assuming Mark Logic database is a mandatory requirement for progress to work, it's magic on. So, um, so is it is it Mark Logic? I mean, I know it's the preferred solution but um but can uh, semaphore be used standalone could it be used with other services jim you want to yeah. take that one yeah absolutely uh the the demo was using mark logic as a database and where we do that with many clients uh it's it's a as you said if you didn't have any other a place to put the data or you weren't satisfied with uh systems you were using we would certainly recommend mark logic we were very successful uh, paired with them because of all the reasons uh, uh, I explained that that it can store uh, well there's many many reasons that that I can't get into but if but certainly in, in terms of the demo we're storing the documents we're storing the data that semaphore generated we can store something I kind of left out was it's also storing the ontologies that drove the extractions so that's where we, it gets into uh, even more on the data harmonization message. That if you're using a tool like MarkLogic, you're, you've got uh, both the ontologies, you've got the documents, you've got the um, fragments of documents that may be most important to you, and and you have the metadata that that Semaphore has extracted or or applied uh, to or from those uh, uh, documents. So it's it's a great solution, but uh, you know, uh, it's absolutely not not required. Yeah. Um... Great, great answer. Um, and um, yeah, it's a uh, like I say, it's an enterprise uh, level solution. So it's designed to work in that environment very much. So not just at um, connecting to the, the to those, but also at scale. Um, yes, good point. Quick one. Um, I think we can probably answer quite quickly. But here in Canada, we manage bilingual documents in French and English. Can this also be managed? 
I'll, I'll do the one. So yeah, the short answer is yes. Um, various, there are various licensing components associated with that. So out of the box, you get like one, one language model, uh, but there are other languages we support and uh, French Canadian is one of them. So yeah, so the, the quick answer is yes. The longer answer is it's a licensable feature of the tool. No worries. Um, and I guess I can't get away from it, but uh, can data harmonization be used to support my AI strategy? Yeah, that we get that one a lot. Um, so, and I, and I assume the question is probably around like a machine learning, a machine learning AI strategy, uh, you know, the chat GPT, generative AI solutions of the world. Um, I, I think the challenge that we're seeing with most clients in that space right now is how do I take that same chat GPT like functionality um, and apply it to my private data sets? right uh, you know, do, do the chat GBT thing but use it with my private data right um, and that and then that basically just translates into well I gotta give really good data uh, to my LLM in order to provide good results you know it's the garbage in garbage out story that you ubiquitously have with data so um, if I want to give good manageable good reliable data into my AI algorithm du jour let's harmonize that data first. So we, we kind of look at Semaphore's ability for data harmonization as a, as a preprocessor into yeah. your ML, ML uh, strategy so that you basically can generate better results. Um, I think we have other webinars that focus really just around generative AI, but uh, that's kind of the, yeah. the, the short answer uh, to how I would leverage AI and Semaphore. Yeah, and it's interesting. Um, I was reading a piece from Gartner around their sort of AI impact radar and at the very center um, was the knowledge model as well. Um, and obviously very important, very important um, aspect to, to certainly um, RAG solutions um, uh, and uh, Semaphore plays, a, plays an important role there, especially with the, with the management and the creation in some cases of the knowledge model. And we have some excellent webinars uh, that we've already done on that topic that uh, we can refer, to, refer you to. Yeah, um, yeah, great. Um, and then, I mean, how many documents do you need to train your models? Like, are we talking thousands? Are we talking, you know, and how, 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 are, we, how are we training? Uh, I'll take that. Well, it was a, the, the quick answer is zero. Uh, semaphore models uh, are not you know, machine learning models in a typical sense. They're not they're not built from uh, uh, massive training sets, uh, which can be very time consuming and kind of mysterious uh, in terms of what they produce. Um, Semaphore is really about documenting exactly what uh, you're trying to find and, and putting that control in the hands of uh, subject matter experts. Um, we didn't look at Semaphore models today, that wasn't the focus, uh, but they are you know, they're targeted at subject matter experts, uh, not programmers or uh, even necessarily data scientists, but of course none of those people are excluded from using Semaphore. Uh, but Semaphore models are, are intended to, to reflect the knowledge of those with expertise uh, in the subject, in uh, knowledge of the concepts, of the concepts that are used in the business. Now, of course, we leverage machine learning uh, uh, mm. quite a bit in, uh, in, in Semaphore. Uh, the the uh, natural language processing engine, we, we uh, saw a little bit of is built uh, with machine learning methods. And uh, of course, even in uh, um, developing new models, uh, text mining, uh, et cetera, uh, uh, there are um, you know, important parts of, of how Sema operates. But it's always about put, keeping the human uh, in the loop. Um, yeah. That's, um, the it, that's, that's what kind of attracted me. When we first took over the technology, that's what kind of like, put it in my head is kind of like mechanizing human knowledge, you know, <laughs> putting, putting human knowledge at a machine scale. It's a really interesting um, subject. Um, my VP of technology, our VP of technology, uh, MJ was on um, the uh, webinar last week uh, discussing sort of data citizens. So those are those subject matter experts that you're getting towards when you're, they can start engaging with the model and, making changes to impact the business um, using 
semaphore and the and, and the team that would manage that much more easy easily than than like I say it being in a spreadsheet and hidden away somewhere. So yeah, it's really good. Um, beside the semaphore products, are there some community projects we can take a look at? Um, I'm guessing that's from uh, some of the stuff that um, we've done um, with customers um, and things like that. We're definitely um, looking at those. Um, we're going to be having a community webinar. We're going to be joined by um, uh, by one of our partners to share some of their stories there. But we're always looking for, for, for people to talk about how they're using Semaphore, what they want to get more out of Semaphore. Having those discussions with us is 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 great for for our community events and events like these. So, if you want to speak and you want to join us, um, please feel free to, to to let us know. Yeah, I um, think just a little additional comment on that one is um, the good news about Semaphore. It's a platform. Uh, the the bad news about Semaphore maybe is there's a thousand use cases for it, right? So because it is a platform, right? So um, I think when you look at you know the things that some four can do it's really as it, it's really more limited by your imagination what your problems are uh, so sometimes it's hard to say oh here's the the one two three things that some four can do um you know today we talk about data harmonization but as you know jim and others mentioned there's a lot of other use cases uh, for the technology as well too yeah and i guess that it kind of fits in that the ai world where there are so many use cases what do you address first and um again i was reading some material on you know look for those use cases that are going to make impact into processes in your business into areas of your business where you're putting human intensive labor to understand your data um semaphore can really help in those areas um so yeah um Feel free to, to to reach out and talk to us uh, about that in more detail. But um, does just to sort of like uh, kind of process question really. But does Semaphore duplicate or keep a copy of the data that it processes? I guess that's kind of a, like a governance question as well, really. Um, do you, uh, yeah, I, I can I can start with that if you okay, want. Sure. Um, yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, I, no, <laughs> basically, uh, is, is the question. I mean, but it, the uh, Semaphore processes the documents. Uh, the, the, where the data goes uh, is uh, is, a, is a different question, whether it goes into uh, uh, directly into a BI tool, whether it goes into your content management system. You know, tagging SharePoint is a is a is a is a big um, Semaphore use case, enriching the uh, uh, indexes of search engines is, is a very big semaphore use case, and of course, if you uh, toss it in the, into uh, Mark Logic, uh, then you get the best of uh, all those worlds. Yeah, yeah, it's able to to store that that data and then query that data as well, um, and actually provide a query that can go right across that data to include structured or unstructured as well as the the RDF or graph data. So. Yeah, really interesting uh, use cases there that can be uh, arisen from that. I guess one of the questions, and you kind of touched on it at the end there, but like, how do you get started on a data harmonization project? Stephen, I'll maybe start with you, and then Jim, maybe you can like pick it up. Yeah, no, it, it's a good question. Um, I, I think the, the the best practice I've seen uh, with with companies, in my experience, is um, you know, they they may create an entity like under the CIO or CDO tree where there's basically a taxonomy council or a metadata council, right? So it's a cross-functional group. It has represents representatives from all your business units. And, you know, the idea is, listen, at some point in the company, we have to make the decision of how we're going to talk about things, right? We can't have nine terms to talk about the same things. Now you can have nine, maybe sub ways of talking about the same thing, but I have to understand, well, what's the highest level concept? We're going to use the term social security number. We're not going to use employee navigation number. We're not going to use a taxpayer navigation number. You know, we're going to standardize on the term social security number. Right, like like I gave in, you know, during the, the presentation. Right now, that doesn't mean you can't represent it, represent it as other things uh, in your organization. But at least at a high level, we'll say governance level, um, we're going to use that term. And that's yeah. that's people in process. There was there was you know there wasn't really technology involved with that. Yeah. Um, and that might be a good segue uh, to Jim because actually Semaphore does help with the governance piece of uh, of taxonomy space as well too. So Jim, did you want to comment on that as well too? 
Yeah, certainly. As I mentioned before, Semaphore's focus is the subject matter experts, the business users. So that modeling component that again we didn't we didn't look at, but uh, is 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 designed. It's the number one principle of of Semaphore is to be easy to use for subject matter experts. So that's what that tool is all about, and it, it, the governance processes are built into it. The workflow, uh, the socialization, being able to pull uh, people that. Uh, may only care about semaphore, you know, once a, you know, every every few months or something. They they but they, we have tools that allow them to quickly um, uh, see these see these models in a very simple way and and make contributions to it. It's it's definitely a, a core part of the design to fit in that type of enterprise construct. Um, yeah. And I guess um, and then the questions just come in here, and I get, I always think that this is like data harmonization is a part of a could be a part of a bigger project around MDM. And with Semaphore, do you think that Semaphore is a replacement tool or is it a complementary tool? I kind of know the answer to this because we we've done an event before, and I think you guys are involved uh, with it as well. Um, but uh, but Stephen, do you want to just quickly... yeah, uh, it's it's a complementary tool, and and the way that I separate uh, the two in my head is you know MDM, I'm getting getting a little data speak here, but you know MDM really focuses on your instance instance data. It, fo it focuses on the records itself, right? My my single source of truth, my social security numbers one two three four five six. Okay, it's not, but you know what I mean. It's one two three four five six seven eight nine, right? And it never changed, and I'm tracking that record of data. Um, Semaphore works solely in the metadata space. So it's kind of like the the circle, if you will, around it, right? So it says this data item is describing the concept of social security number, but it isn't the data item itself, right? Yeah. So that's how we think about it. Da uh, Semaphore is strictly your metadata tool. And MDM tools are strictly your instance data tool. So that's yeah. how I have separated and how they work together. Yeah. It's interesting because we did a um, we did a like we mentioned uh, that we did a session on this and um, with with Mark Logic that that circle we call an envelope so we put that metadata on that envelope but that data itself is is completely unchanged so you can then make you know records and you can keep track of the data um, and and then govern it in that way if you, if you'd like. Um, I've got one more, let's have a look. So how does data harmonization integrate with existing data management and analytics systems? Um, semi related to MDM, but yeah, how do, how, yeah. how does it integrate with those? Yeah, it kind of ties into that, doesn't it? Um, uh, again, back to the idea of being a complementary solution. Uh, so that the, you know, the data that Semaphore generates or Semaphore manages uh, can be used kind of independently uh, of, of a larger systems, but really, um, and it could feed directly into an analytic system uh, just by, you know, analyzing file shares and, and extracting data and, and then using that for analytics. But in, in most cases, it's really part of a kind of an enterprise architecture where there might be a middle a harmonization tier. I think one of uh, Stephen's slides really presented that well, where Semaphore helps to make as a like kind of a translation layer, the semantic translation layer that's focused on the concepts, not the specific data. That's another distinction with MDM. I would I would draw, um, and that it, you know, if you're looking for social security numbers or market cap, uh, it that translation is managed in in Semaphore, uh, so that uh, if somebody asks for something in one language. Uh, uh, Semaphore can help interpret interpret that and and uh, and then understand the concept that somebody's searching for and then use whatever uh, code or term or that is important that is used in this in the systems where the data resides uh, to, to pull that data back and present it to the user in a, in a unified harmonized uh, view yeah um, and, uh, and this one's kind of for me that the, I mean the semaphore provides a, a great UI um, one that seems to help bring data, harmonized of course um, but to business process experts so like information engineers knowledge managers etc you know it is almost a low code solution um, you know is is that like a deliberate choice and 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 do you think that's going to continue to evolve in the future in that direction 
Um, I, I, I can at least start with the response on that one. Um, so the, the short answer, yeah, I mean, short long answer, right? Uh, the short answer is I, I always like to make analogies to things. And I kind of think as Semaphore as a crowdsourcing tool, if you're kind of familiar with that, right? Where I'm soliciting knowledge from anyone in my organization and they're contributing to the knowledge body of my company, right? Well, the sheer fact that it's anybody in my organization, it has to be basically zero code, right? Because it has to be accessible by anyone. And that that's by design. And Semaphore was yeah. always kind of fundamentally designed that way so that I can put it in the hands of anyone in the company. They don't have to know a, a line of programming. It, it's all GUI based. Now you do, there is a very robust API under the covers. So if you're if you're trying to do you know sophisticated integration work or you're just more of like a power user, you, yeah. you can access the API. Um, but really the intent is we can put this power in the hands of you know anyone and they can leverage it. Yeah. And, and and Jim, I guess from from your perspective, it's great because, you know, like I say, from a technical point of view, it removes that burden, and you can really start asking conversations around that. What is your data? How is your data stored? What you know? What does it mean to you? Those type of questions. Yeah, I think it's it's a it's a good contrast with uh, traditional MDM tools as well that are designed to for the enterprise architect, not for the uh, end user. Yeah. Well, we're coming up to the top of the hour. I think we've covered most of the questions. Um, if we haven't um, got to your question, or if you have got more questions, then um, please feel free to, uh, to, to reach out to us. Um, we have Stephen and uh, Jim's email is just there for you um, to, to, to have a look at there. So please reach out to them. Um, try and try and give them some good questions. Give, they, they like good, good questions. The hard ones. Thinkers. Yeah, give them the thinkers. Um, um, we've got more information on our website. There's a QR code there. I've also put a link in the chat. Uh, coming up in March, we briefly talked about AI here, and we've mentioned it before. But we've got an AI roundtable. That's that second QR code and a link that I've just put in the chat for you there. That's on the 7th of March. That's going to be a really interesting conversation. We're going right across um, uh, the, the sort of Mark Logic and Semaphore solution, maybe looking at other technologies and, and, and how they integrate and things like that, talking about where we're going, why we're doing it, what we're seeing with customers. Um, so if you, if you want to sign up to that, please feel free to do so. Um, but with that, um, it's thanks to, to Stephen and Jim. Um, really look forward to, to chatting with you again soon, hopefully. Um, please feel free to check out the website, look at uh, web webinars that are coming up, um, including our new community event, which uh, we're planning for next month. Um, but with that, um, that is it. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks everyone. everyone.